Hi everyone, I'm Jay Fadden. Thank you so much for joining us today on This Is The Day. Father Reed, we have a wonderful group with us and also a good friend. That's right, let's start with the good friend, okay. Jay. It's All Saints Day and Andreas Widmer is with us. He's a former member of the Swiss Guard, you know, and he's here to talk about his great new book. It's called The Pope and the CEO, John Paul II's Leadership Lessons to a Young Swiss Guard. And of course, we have some great kids from the third and the sixth grade, all saints in the making, from Chevra School in Sacred Hearts Parish. Father Dan Hickey's the pastor over there. Great pastor. Kevin, what will we hear about in the news today? Well, Jay, the Pope had a full slate of meetings yesterday. We go to the Vatican to tell you all about them. Also, the Pope prays for victims of flooding in Thailand and Northwest Italy. And if you are a Catholic, you will soon be allowed to marry a British monarch. All those stories had in the news, Jay. Sounds good to me. All that and much more right now on This Is The Day. Hello, hello, hello. I'm Jay Fadden. Thank you so much for joining us today on This Is The Day. I'm joined by my wonderful friends, Father Reed and Kevin Nelson, and our great friends who have joined us here uh, in our living room. From this Shepherds. is awesome. Yeah, all saints in the making. And we actually have some actual saints in the front, or representations thereof. If you were watching Mass today, you would have met St. Francis of Assisi and St. Joseph and St. Theodore. Mm -hmm. I got that right that time, uh, and then uh, Mother Ann Seton, and of course the patroness of Catholic TV right there, St. Therese of Lisio the Little Flower. With your roses, by the way, I love that. Yeah. Uh, are you guys having a fun visit today? Yes! Well, that's what we'd it's like to great to, to have hear. you here. This is fun. And look at you. You've come with props today. What, what do you have I did, going well, here? I just celebrated Mass on this, the Solemnity of All Saints, and this is my chalice, but the only reason it's I brought beautiful. it down was because we'd, we'd think thinking about all the saints today. And blessed John Paul II blessed this for me and used it for the first time on the Feast of Corpus Christi, 1985. So it's kind of my memento of uh, blessed John Paul II. And then, of course, we have, I brought this down from the chapel. This is the relic of St. Therese, the little flower, the real St. Therese. Mm. It's a first-class relic. It's a piece of her to remind us of her holiness. And she's our big friend here, our patroness at Catholic TV. So it's a big day, so we have that, and we have a lot of people have actually sent in uh, forms to us here at Catholic TV to remember yes. their loved ones. I have mine, actually, right here. This is my... That is yours. This is mine. This has uh, my parents and some of my friends and grandparents and everything. And I'm going to, right after the show today, I'm going to go up and put this in the basket in our beautiful chapel here at uh, Ho uh, Catholic TV. And uh, what we're going to do is, at every Mass throughout the month of November, we're going to pray... Uh, for the people who have gone before us, that they too will join all the saints in heaven. You know, it's always interesting because when you lose someone you love, uh, it can be a very difficult moment. Yeah. But it's also a moment to reflect on what they meant to you and your life and how empty your life would be if they were never there. Sure. So sometimes you have to accept that sadness to know that someone you loved was in your life, which is always a great thing. And you know who, who filled out mine? My kids. Your kids. Yeah. They, they filled it out. They actually, they put you in there. I know, you told me that. And you, it made me a little nervous. Yeah, you, you didn't know where to <laughs> yeah. go with that. So it was, and what do you think of this, though? So we have this whole group here. We've got third and, and sixth graders. Third and sixth, yep. Uh, all Shivers. dressed. A fine school. Do you guys like school? Yes. Wait, let's, let's, let's try that again. Do you guys like school? Yes! All right. Okay, well, that's a little bit better. I just want to make sure. Because, you know, this is your big opportunity, actually, where you, you know, you could talk loud. Because now we have to be quiet again. What we're doing, actually, is what, we're dragging, we're dragging the, uh, the trip out a little bit for them so that they don't have to go right back to school. Not that Chevrolet School is not one of the finest examples of Catholic school in the United States of America. And not that they wouldn't, you know, just be dying to get back to class. But we thought we'd drag it out a little bit for you. You don't mind, do you? No. <laughs> hey, why, uh, why is St. Therese, because I know St. Therese is your favorite saint. A little flower. Right there, yes. Yeah. Why, why is she your favorite saint? Well, y you talk about people that we've lost. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, the saints are the people that we know who have gone from our life and from this earth. And now we, we are certain that they're in heaven. 
and because they've been canonized and there's a whole process that we go through like we are with blessed John Paul II. We'll be talking more about that later. But to know that St. Therese is in heaven, she's always been so good to me. Like when I've had problems and I've had, uh, you know, questions in my life, I've always kind of turned to her and said, hey, St. Therese, could you pray for me? Mm -hmm. And somehow things have always worked out. So she's been a friend to me and I thought that she would be a great friend to Catholic TV and she has to this very day. Yeah, it's always important too that people realize that you can say to a saint, hey, listen, help me out here a yeah. little bit, that you're not alone. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and we're not alone here because Andres is with us. Andres. Who's a Swiss guard. Who's a Swiss guard. And, you know, we like the Swiss guard. Oh, yeah. They're In awesome. In fact, he introduced to, a, to us a number of uh, this great Swiss guard, past and present. One of them in particular, a corporal who is presently uh, a Swiss guard, uh, Irvin. And we had a chance to talk to him right in the barracks on one of our infamous, or famous, I should say, little Viaggio a Roma. So let's take a trip to Rome right now and go to the Swiss Guard Barracks. Hey, back to Rome. I'm Father Reed. Ciao, everyone. We're here in Vatican City. Actually, we're in the barracks, and I'm with a distinguished member of what is perhaps the best-dressed militia in the world. Uh, Erwin, great to be with you. Thank you. Oh, it's wonderful, wonderful to see you. You know, January 22nd, 1506, is the official date of the birth of the Pontifical Swiss Guard. And on that day, towards the evening, a group of 150 Swiss soldiers entered the Vatican for the very first time and were blessed by Pope Julius II. You remember that day, don't you? No. You're not that old, okay. Hey, don't be fooled by the designer duds. Under these bright baggy bloomers and the tilted beret stands a lean, mean fighting machine as well as a courteous helper of lost and curious tourists. What's like the most common question that people ask? Yeah, the most common question, of course, is where is the Sistine Chapel? Ah. Yeah. Where we can get tickets for the Pope's audience. But that's how it is. That makes sense. Now, you have some requirements. You have to be Swiss, obviously. Of what else? course, you have to be a Swiss citizen. You have to do first your base training within the Swiss Army. Okay. You have to be taller than 174. Mm -hmm. You need to have a professional degree or a higher school degree. And you have to be willing to, to sacrifice your life for the Holy Father. Yeah, too. there is the assermentation ceremony every 6th of May. Okay. And there the new guards are swearing, if it's necessary, even to sacrifice the life. And you keep guard at all the entrances. You, you're there for liturgical celebrations in St. Peter's Basilica, the general audiences during the visits of the Holy Father by heads of state or governments, foreign ministers and, and ambassadors. The Swiss Guard is right there. And the main weapon is? You may mean as the Hellbard. The Hellbard, that's it. That's but it. it's not. It's a part it's of the uniform. It's a part of as the uniform. As the sword is. But the commander says always the first weapon of the guard is to speak. To speak. And Isn't then that interesting? To touch. Uh -huh. And then you have other weapons. But I can't tell you. Okay. Uh, we, I, we, I want to ask. We won't go there. And the, the, uh, people think it's been designed, the uniform by Michelangelo, but it's not true. But that's another story for another day. Hey, the Swiss Guard do answer many questions with poise and sometimes even a smile, oftentimes a smile. And it was an undercover guard, I think, who helped Pope John Paul II during the assassination attempt back in May of 1981 at St. Peter's, wasn't it? Okay, yes. Of course, because of course. you've sworn to protect the Holy Father. The Papal Swiss Guard tradition has been marching on for over 500 years right now. Continuously active military corps, the longest one in history, numbering how many men? 110. 110. The Swiss Guard may be the world's smallest army, but they're one of the coolest. <laughs> From the barracks of the Pontifical Swiss Guard with Erwin. Ciao, amici. Ci vediamo presto. Ci vediamo presto. Thank you. Thank you. I always love that music. You know, what a wonderful, wonderful guy he He's is. He's a good man, and, and they were all wonderful to us. The Swiss Guard, as a group, 
are just wonderful, wonderful guys. I, I just, I was so astounded we were in the barracks, how kind they were to us. Yeah, and yeah. as you said, a special thanks to Andreas because he's the one who actually introduced us. He actually made it happen. And then we get over there and it was as if we were long lost friends. And mm -hmm. it was very difficult getting into the Vatican and that's not an easy thing to do, but they made it happen. They made it happen. And then yeah. you get to watch it at home, which is always nice. Did you hear Aaron there at the end? He said, Chivity amo presto. I love that. I think you should end every program here like that too, but. <laughs> we will well, today. We will today, okay, good. If I remember. Kevin, how are you doing over there? Good, Jay, Father Reed. How was the trick-or-treating? <laughs> trick-or-treating was good, very busy. Did you take any candy into work today? Um, y no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that wasn't a difficult question. We, we, we were uh, going to come and get it. That's why. <laughs> I yeah. ate it all, actually. You're probably trying to hide it from us. <laughs> hey, Kevin, what's going on around the world in the Catholic faith? All right, thanks, Jay and Father. Hello, everyone. It is time to take a look at the news. We begin with news out of the Vatican. Pope Benedict XVI met with the new ambassador to Brazil, also had a meeting with heads of the Bishops' Conference from Venezuela, and met with bishops from Angola. It was a busy day yesterday for the Pope, and Carol Glatz from Catholic News Service has all the details. Pope Benedict held a full slate of meetings this morning, starting with Brazil's new ambassador to the Vatican. The Pope asked the diplomat to pass on his thanks and appreciation to the Brazilian government for its openness in having Rio de Janeiro host World Youth Day in 2013. The church has long had an important role in Brazil, the Pope said, from Catholic schools and hospitals to the church's efforts in eradicating poverty and hunger. The Pope then met with heads of Venezuela's Bishops' Conference. The President, Vice President, Secretary General, and Cardinal Urosa Savino met with the Pope this morning. While we don't know the nature of the private talks this morning, the Venezuelan bishops are greatly concerned about the current campaign climate in their country. President Hugo Chavez is up for re-election in 2012, and Venezuelan Catholic leaders have been among the harshest critics of Chavez's socialist policies. The bishops published two weeks ago a statement calling for greater civility and respect since an election season can generate too much fanaticism and verbal and physical aggression, they said. The statement said the Christian vocation is to build reconciliation and peace and not further polarize one's nation. And lastly, the Pope continued a series of meetings with bishops from Angola, who are here on their ad limina visit to report on the state of their diocese. The U.S. bishops will be here later this week. The last time they came for their ad limina was seven years ago, in 2004. Looking now at news from around the country, the U.S. Bishops Committee on Doctrine, in a response to Sister Elizabeth A. Johnson's defense, have reaffirmed their concerns that her 2007 book, Quest for the Living God, Mapping Frontiers in the Theology of God, is seriously inadequate as a presentation of the Catholic understanding of God. The committee, chaired by Cardinal Donald Worrell of Washington, said that Sister Elizabeth's response to their original critique of March 24th had not in fact demonstrated that the committee has misunderstood or misrepresented the book. Sister Elizabeth, the Sister of St. Joseph, is a professor of systematic theology at Fordham University. She's currently on sabbatical, but released a statement in response to the committee's findings, saying she read the statement with sadness. She also said she was disappointed in the way the committee addressed its response, pointing to the process the bishops undertook, the content of their message, and the result of their findings. She said she wanted to make it absolutely clear that nothing in the book dissents from the church's faith about God revealed in Jesus Christ through the Spirit. The bishops noted in their statement that Sister Elizabeth explained in her response that her book expresses the Catholic faith in different words but with the same meaning. But the bishops said when the committee examined the particular points at issue, they were confirmed in the judgment that these different words do not in fact adequately express the faith of the church. The bishops also said their comments were referencing Sister Elizabeth's book and were not intended as judgment of the personal intention of the author. In other news now from the Vatican, there has been severe flooding in Thailand, which has affected an estimated 2.8 million households, as well as caused more than 380 deaths. In northwestern Italy, at least nine people have died after heavy rains caused mudslides and flooding. Pope Benedict XVI talked about both these natural disasters as it, at his Angelus address. Rome Reports has all the details. During Sunday's Angelus, the Pope prayed for the victims of the recent floods in Thailand and Italy. Vorrei esprimere la mia vicinanza ai popoli della Thailandia colpiti da grave inondazioni, come pure in Italia a quelle della Liguria e della Toscana, recentemente danneggiate dalle conseguenze di forti piogge. 
The Pope said the best way to help society is by supporting those who are close to us and also by living an honest life. Christ urges us to combine humility with our charitable service towards our brothers and sisters. Indeed, may we always imitate this perfect example of service in our daily lives. The role teachers have in society was also highlighted by the Pope. He said they're called to be a true example for their students on a daily basis. And finally in the news, one of the reforms that have been announced by the 16 nations that have Queen Elizabeth II as their constitutional head of state is that the law that bans a British monarch from marrying a Catholic is to be lifted after more than 300 years. But they will not include the repeal of a Catholic becoming monarch because allegiance to the Pope might conflict with the sovereign's rule as the supreme governor of the Church of England. The announcement made at a recent summit of Commonwealth heads of government in Perth, Australia, was welcomed by Catholic leaders in Britain. Archbishop Vincent Nichols of Westminster, president of the Bishops' Conference of England and Wales, said this will eliminate a point of unjust discrimination against Catholics and will be welcomed not only by Catholics, but far more widely. The reforms also included an end to the ancient tradition of the male primogeniture, the rule under which boys take precedence in the line to the throne over elder sisters. The reforms will be included in the next British program of parliamentary business to be unveiled in November. And that is all the news we have for you on this Tuesday, November 1st, 2011. We're going to send it right back over to Father Reed and Jay with more of This is the Day. Hey, Kevin, before we get to Andreas, I got this letter. Uh oh. And yes, I did. I'm looking forward to watching House and Home. Is Kevin cooking? <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to be any, doing any cooking? I just want to know that for Pauline. I'm not at liberty to say, Jay. They have uh, kept me under a uh, lock and key. I can't give any information. <laughs> Can I be honest with you? Because I was there. Yeah. I think I did more cooking than he did. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's not a surprise. I think, I think supervision is a very important <laughs> process. Well, Pauline's also well. looking forward, by the way, to the sitcom. Um, she says it seems very funny, so we'll see. Very good. Kevin, we'll see you a little later on. Joining us now is Andres, who has always been so great to us here at Catholic TV. When, Andres, when I heard you were going to be here, Father Reed and I were talking about it this morning. Always look forward to it. Always look forward to it. He's the author of a great new book, uh, and it's, he tells us about being a Swiss guard during the papacy of the blessed John Paul II, who we are all great fans of. So, again, thanks for being with us today. How are you thanks doing? Thanks for having me. I'm great. You know, well, I learned something. I didn't know you were a soccer coach. I learned that today. <coughs> I am of the yellow team. Of the yellow team. <laughs> of the infamous yeah, the yellow infamous team. And Scott Landry, the two of you. Yes. What a yeah, dynamic duo. Yeah, yeah. And there's a third coach, too, because we have like 30 kids. Do you really? Yeah. Wow. Well, listen, you came from a secular environment. Yeah. What made you decide to become a Swiss Guard? Because people don't realize how difficult that is. Yeah. So first off, the Swiss Guards is a, is a militia, is a, not a militia, a, a foreign legion. That means a foreign legion is when you serve a foreign head of state. So usually you'd go to jail. If, if a, an American would go into the French foreign legion, you'd go to jail when you come back. <laughs> but the Swiss have a special arrangement with the, uh, with the Vatican uh, <coughs> that you can go and serve there and give up your p passport while you're there and then come back and they won't prosecute you. Mm -hmm. So the Swiss guards and the Swiss government or army are not really connected. It's separate. Um, and the reason why I became a Swiss guard is because... Being a, becoming a bodyguard is about the coolest thing I could <laughs> think of when I was 19 years old. And that's why I did it. The fact that it ended up being the Pope that I would protect, yeah. that was great. But bodyguard, that's the coolest thing I could think of. <laughs> you and look like a bodyguard too, by the way. And, you know, they loved the size and everything. I was yeah. a little fitter then. <laughs> and um, I just did this for purely, uh, in that sense, selfish reasons that I thought... Be becoming a, uh, a bodyguard was just, I couldn't think of a better thing to do. Mm -hmm. And this is a picture of Andreas when he was but 20 years old, a young Swiss guard. <laughs> and there he is. You haven't changed that much. Not a bit. No, not at <laughs> no. all. Not at all. But what was it like? You know, John, Pope John Paul II, such a wonderful, great yeah. pope, now blessed. What was it like? What kind of an impact did he have upon you? Now, let me start. First, you see, when, when I became... Uh, as an adolescent, I'm a product of the 70s, right after Vatican II. Things with the catechesis weren't so great. I, I knew more about Buddha than I knew about Jesus Christ after my religious education. And so I wasn't really uh, into my faith. I certainly didn't have a personal relationship with Christ consciously. And so I 
come there and I see this man, I was introduced to him in a sense, I didn't really know what it meant to be the Pope and all that, so I wasn't, I wasn't like in awe at, at when, I, when I'm, you know, at, at who he was as far as the papacy is concerned. So I just met him as a man, as he was my boss. Sure. And <coughs> after a while of serving him and uh, observing him every day, I, you know, I went to the guard sort of seeking. I didn't know who I was. I, I, I certainly sort of felt, uh, you know, as a 20-year-old, 19-year-old, you're not sure of who you are, you are and you sort of seek uh, your place in the world and everything. And I was insecure. After watching him for a while, I said, I, I remember the moment of thinking, gee, whatever this guy has, that's what I want. Mm. Because he was the most authentically human person that I ever met in my life. And that made a huge impression on me. So here you are, you go over, your 19-year-old kid, yeah. and you're really going over there, you, it's a cool thing, going to be a body guy. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you meet the Holy Father for Catholics, you know, apostolic succession, it's a huge deal for us, but for you, you know, you're going to be a body guy. Yeah. Was there really moments that you can remember in detail that, well, not in detail, but yeah. you can remember where you just said, oh my goodness, I am standing in front of an yeah. extremely holy man. Once I was asked to protect him during a rosary, and there were about 50 or 100 people in the room, and I was standing next to him in front of him, and he was on a prie-dieu, on a kneeler, and he started to pray. And after a while, I started to feel peaceful and fulfilled. Mm -hmm. I can't say it in a different way. People who listen to this might think that that's strange, but just take, m take my word for it. I felt different after he started to pray. My first reaction was, He's faking it. And I thought, hold on a minute. Actually, I feel different. How is he <laughs> faking it if I feel different? And I just, uh, that, that was sort of the opening for me of saying, maybe there is something to this. Mm. What, if, what if this is true? What if Christ, wh what if you can actually have a personal relationship? Because Christ died, yes, but he resurrected as well. So if Christ resurrected, then he's alive. Then he's a person and I can have a relationship with this person? That made me very curious, and I explored that. And this should make all of us curious about your new book here, The Pope and the CEO, because a lot of revelations came to you and lessons uh, that still uh, deeply touch your life and affect the way that you act as an entrepreneur now. Uh, tell us about the book. What, what made you write this? One of the key things that I learned from John Paul is the value of vocation and the value of work. Vocation first. The fact is, uh, you know, the Catholic Church teaches about the universal vocation, primary and secondary vocation. That, if you look at it in theory, may be a little dry. But what I found out is that the primary, the, the universal vocation that we have is a, is a vocation to fulfillment and happiness. And the most happy we could be is we saw the kids here before and, and playing the saints. The happiest you could possibly be is to be with God in heaven. That is our universal vocation. We're all called to this. God wants us to be happy, and he wants us to be with him. So we're all called to that. What do you have to do in life to be that, to get that? It's, um, it's in a sense like we're all trying out for the Red Sox. And to be on the team is the, is, is the, is the heaven, sort of an, as an uh, allegory. Um, but we have to train for that. You know, so, so you're going to be called, and you can, uh, you can pitch and everything, but at the end of the day, uh, we receive a great amount of grace to get there, but we also can do things to get better at this and to actually get onto that team. John Paul would always say, it's actually not that difficult to become a saint because God wants us to be saints, and God gives us all the tools in life to become a saint. That leads us to the, second and, uh, to the first and second level of vocation. The first level is my, my, my way of life. You may be called in your life to, become, to, to consecrate your life as a priest. Uh, as a lay person, you, uh, or a priest, a deacon, as a lay person, you may be called to be a brother or a sister or a consecrated lay person, a single person, um, or you may be called to, uh, to marriage. Um, that, is, that is a tool that God gives you uh, to, ma to, uh, uh, to help you uh, uh, fulfill your life and find that path to sainthood. Secondary, secondary, uh, the, the secondary vocation then is to say, I like to say, 
the secondary vocation is about saying, okay, so what are you going to do all day? You know, we know that what you're called to, we know what your particular way of life is, now what are you going to do? That's the secondary vocation. That has to do with work. And John Paul pointed out that work is not something that is caused by sin. You know, when you look around on a Monday morning and you see all the grim faces going to work, you think that, that work is a cause of, of sin after the fall, but that's not true. God uh, asked us to work and imitate him as a worker. He created, he's the creator, he's a worker. And he asked us to join him in paradise to continue the work of creation. That's what our work is all about. And so when you're looking at your work, uh, God didn't make us uh, work to do more. He made us work to become more. Mm -hmm. Could you ever have imagined as a 19-year-old kid that here you would be, just a few years later, would sit here, though, really evangelizing? Mm -hmm. This is what the gift that yeah. Blessed Pope John Paul II gave to you and so many of us. You know, when I left... Uh, my last audience with John Paul was in December of, two th uh, of 1988. And he comes into the room. He knew that uh, every quarter he goes into a room on the way to the uh, general audience or on the way back, and he knows there's going to be the guards there who leave. And he comes into the room, and he sees me in that room. And he says, Andreas, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm leaving. And he says, you just started. What? <laughs> and he said, all right, wasn't I good to you? Don't you like it here? Is there anything I can do? I said, no, you know, Holy Father, I'm not getting any younger. And he starts to laugh, and he says, how old are you? <laughs> I said, 22. <laughs> of course, I thought that was way up there. And he, you know, he, we choked around a bit. And, but at the end, he took my hand, and he says, Andreas, you found Christ here. Now go out into the world and share Christ with, in whatever wow. you do. And it took me a while to, you know, to go through my life and find my place in life. And so when I see, when I write in this book, and I do evangelize now, I think back of that mission, of that commission he gave me. What a great, great gift that is. Just be a but great Christmas people, gift. Too. Yeah, where can people yeah. learn more about it? So I have a website called The Pope and the CEO. I get a lot of feedback. It's been out for a month now. And I'm, I'm very happy to say that a lot of people buy more than one book because this is a, the book is written in a way... I'm a business person, I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm writing about it from that perspective. So a lot of people that I, uh, that I hear from buy the book and then buy several books to give away to other people to sort of evangelize to the person who may not regularly go to Mass or so, um, to find a way in to find meaning in their work. Very good. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Andreas. It has been a pleasure. And thank you for joining us today on This is the Day. And know that all of you are in our thoughts and in our prayers. And on this Feast of All Saints, if I could ask God's special blessing upon you and give you that blessing using the relic of our patroness, St. Therese. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you so much to Andreas for joining us. And all of you, may God give you a great day and a great week. God bless you. Hello everyone, Father Reed inviting you to join us here in the Catholic TV living room for This is the Day on Friday because Deacon Paul and Mrs. Jackie Iacono will be with us to talk about the Fra Angelico Institute for Sacred Arts in Rhode Island and pursuing what Pope Benedict has called a culture of beauty. It's all happening right here in the Catholic TV living room this Friday on This is the Day on America's Catholic Television Network, Catholic TV.